Good morning, good morning, good morning. We're glad you're able to join us today at the New Beginning Church. Thank you so much for being a part of our service. We are joining you as you join us. And we're asking you, the Lord, by participating in our service today. Yes, I'm here at the New Beginning Church, and, and it's you and me today, you and me. Let us go to God in prayer. Father God in heaven, it's in the name of Jesus Christ we come. We thank you, Lord, for another privilege, another chance, another opportunity. God, we thank you, Father God, for blessing us and keeping us. We thank you, Lord, for health, life, and strength. God, we thank you, Father God, for another chance to honor you. We thank you, Father God, for breath. We thank you for blessing us. We thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing through us. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless this day. Forgive us for our sins, Lord. Forgive us for what we thought. Forgive us for what we've done. Forgive us, Father God, for how we acted. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless our church, bless every member, bless every visitor. We pray that you bless this message today, that lives will be changed and hopes will be renewed, Father God, and that people will be saved. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory, all the honor and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Today we're in the book of Revelation. We're at Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6 and our, our scripture today will come from verses 9, 10, and 11. Verses 9 through 11 is where we are today. Revelation chapter 6 verses 9 through 11. We thank God for another privilege, another God-given moment just to lift up his name. God has blessed us again. Revelation Revelation, one revelation, the revelation that Jesus Christ gave to John, who has been which has been passed on to us. We thank you for joining us live on Facebook Live and YouTube. Thank you so much for being a part of our service on today. Revelation chapter six, verses nine and ten. When you found it, you will discover these words. When he opened the fifth seal. I saw under the altar souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, will you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell in the earth? Then white robes were given to them, given to each of them, and it was said that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. I want to talk about the fifth seal, the fifth seal. We have thus talked about how John was on this island called Patmos. And while he was there, he was in the spirit of the Lord on the Lord's day. He was there because of the word of God and for the testimony that he had given about Jesus Christ. I said to you previously that many times you don't have to do anything wrong, but people will do you wrong regardless of how you've done them. So John is exiled on this lonely island called Patmos. I said to you that this island was only about eight feet wide and 10 feet long. I'm sorry, 10 miles long and eight miles wide. He was there. There was no choir there. There were no musicians there. There was no amen corner there. He was exiled on an island called Patmos for doing what is right. He heard a voice behind him said, right, and what you hear, put it in the book. This book has since become the book of Revelation. He said, send it to the seven churches of Asia Minor. He identified each church, and as he identified each church, he told those churches about themselves. And as he told those churches about themselves, he reminded them of their good, their bad, and their ugly. He walked through each one of these churches and addressed them personally. And then in chapter four, John gives us a picture of heaven. He gives us a picture of heaven. And he says in John chapter four that there was a room in heaven where there was a person or being sitting on the throne. We find out later that that being is God. 
He talks about the fact that there are four creatures, four beastly creatures that are around the throne of God crying, holy, holy, holy. There are there are 24 elders around the throne of God saying, holy, holy, holy. Bless the one who is and who is to come. Then we move to chapter five where we are looking. We finding that there was no one in heaven worthy to open the scroll. There was no one, no, no person, no angel in heaven, no person, no angel on earth, no person, no angel under the earth that was worthy to open the stroll. But then Jesus, the Lamb of God, they discovered in chapter five that Jesus, the Lamb of God, is the only one worthy of opening the stroll. Jesus opens the stroll and when he opens the stroll, all kinds of things begin to unfold. In chapter six, we find out that there were four horsemen riding. Now, remember now, this is futuristic. This is in the future. This has not happened yet, but it is the future. It is the future after the church age. We now live in the church age. This is the age of the church where, where the church is honoring God, where the church is leading people to get to know Jesus Christ, where the church is evangelizing, the church is is walking the streets and and we are telling people about Jesus. We are witnessing for him because the four horsemen will ride one day because we need to leave here and go to heaven. We need to take some people with us. Therefore, we must witness of Jesus the Christ. Chapter six opened up with these four horsemen and the first seal was broken. When the first seal was broken, there was a white horse. And this white horse was riding and this white horse had a rider on it and the rider was riding to conquer and the rider was conquering. I said to you, uh, don't let what was white fool you just because it's white. It's not right. It's not always right. Therefore, we find out as we examine the text that this rider is the Antichrist himself. The rider is not Jesus. The purpose of this white horse and his rider is to make sure that people believe that the Antichrist is God. Matter of fact, the Antichrist looked to seduce us, look to seduce human beings, even in today's age, to believe that he is God. Let me tell you, the Antichrist is conquering and he is going forth to conquer. In other words, he's fooling people all around the world. And it doesn't, you don't have to wait until that period come. You can see it live and in color even right now. When he opened up the second seal, the second seal was a fiery red horse. And this fiery red horse was, was granted opportunity to take away peace. There was no peace. There will be no peace. There will be no love. There will be nothing but war. He was given a sword. And he was to kill people. And we can see evidence of that today where people will kill people for no apparent reason. The second horse will come with bloodshed and people shall be killed. Then there's the third horse. The third horse is riding and and the third horseman has a has a scale in his hand, a balance. I said to you that this balance is much like what they use to weigh out cotton in the cotton picking days. Yeah, they would put a scale across at the top of a, a beam and, and that scale will be have a weight on one side and have a bale of cotton or a sack of cotton on the other side. And they would keep adding weight to it. And when it leveled off, that's how much your cotton weighed. I know some of you can't identify to that, but I can identify to that as far back as the age of five as a little boy where people would pick cotton and they would let me crawl through the cotton field and watch them. And they would take the cotton and, and then they would make little children cotton sacks where we could pull and we would weigh our cotton on the scale. But the scale of the third rider, the rider here has a scale and he's saying that famine will be all throughout the land. 
Not only will there be a famine, there will be inflation. And in, in a day's work will be worth about 20 cents. We can see evidence of that today with uh, strengthflation, where things are getting smaller, but they're costing more. We would not have, they, those who live during this time would not have enough money to buy food. There will be a famine throughout the land. And when this famine hit, the black horseman will come and he will bring a rider that will usher in famine. <laughs> then there's the fourth seal. The fourth seal will be open. And when the fourth seal is open, there will be a pale horse. This pale horse represents death. It represents sickness. It represents us just represent people just dying away because the rider on this horse is given a name. It is death. The rider, death, is personified. Death is riding and shortly behind death is Hades, the grave. Yeah, if you if you if you're not saved, you will fall victim to one of these four horsemen. And and when you fall victim to the rider of the the fourth horse, when the fourth seal is open, you will look death dead in the face. Death will take the life of a fourth of the earth and and people will be killed with the sword. People will be killed by hunger and people will be killed by the pestilence or beast of the earth. And we come to seal number five. When we look at seal number five, we find that the fifth seal is open. And the fifth seal introduces us to souls that are crying under the altar. The fifth seal takes a heavenly view as it did, as John showed us in, in Revelation chapter four. He takes us back and he gives us another tidbit from heaven. He says that the lamb broke the seal known as the fifth seal. And when the fifth seal was broken, a sight was seen in heaven. It was a sight in heaven because the Bible says that the souls were under the altar and the souls were crying out from under the altar. I want to say to you today, the lamb breaks the fifth seal. And when he breaks the fifth seal, we see this sight in heaven. And the sight in heaven is that souls are crying out under the altar. They're crying out. How long, Lord? They're crying out, Lord faithful and true, Lord, holy and mighty. How long, Lord, who is sovereign? How long, Lord, will you allow them to continue to walk the earth, those who have slain us? My point to you today is, while our souls are crying on the altar, the most holy place is where the souls are. The souls are in the best place. The souls are at the foot of Jesus. The souls are at the foot of the cross. The souls are at the altar and they are crying out, Lord, how long? The souls, the souls are crying out, Lord, how long will you let this go? Look at verse number nine, Revelation chapter six, verse number nine. And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar souls of those who have been slain for the word of God. They had been slain for the testimony which they held. Let me just say to you this morning, you need to understand that you will be persecuted for the word of God. Some will be slain for the word of God. You will be persecuted for what you believe, for your profession of your faith, for your testimony and how you love the Lord and how good God has been to you. You will be slain. Some will be slain. For the word of God. Some people don't even have to worry about it. Some people don't even have to look at it. Some people don't even have to wonder about it simply because you're not going to testify of God's goodness and you're not going to study and read God's word, especially in public. But these souls on an altar, this is doing during the period that is after the church age. This is after the church has been raptured off. When John talks to us in Revelation chapter four, he shows a picture of heaven. And this is a picture of how the church has been raptured away and what the church will see after we are raptured away. But this picture that he paints of heaven shows a picture of souls crying out, Lord, 
How long? Look at verse number 10. And they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord? How long, Lord? And Lord, we know you are holy and we know you are true. How long? We know you're going to get revenge, Lord. But Lord, how long? How long, Lord? How long will it be until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on earth? Lord, how long? Somebody's asking right today, how long do I have to suffer through this? How long do I have to go through this? Now, this is not you. If you're saved, this is not you under the altar. This is not you crying out for these are the ones who are suffering, who will suffer through the great tribulation. They cried, how long, Lord, how long would this go on? See, we cry out to the Lord and we ought to cry out to the Lord. God, how long are we going to go through this? Yes, yeah, we quote scripture. The scripture says to us, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. The, the, the souls are crying out. It says to us that persecutors will will persecute you, persecutors will slay you, persecutors will murder you, persecutors will will kill you. But the fact of the matter is God gets revenge. Vengeance is mine, said the Lord, and if vengeance belongs to the Lord, it's not our place to take vengeance. He says that he said the, the, these souls are crying out and as they cry out, they are wondering, Lord, how long are we going to have to go through this stuff? Lord, how long are we going to have to deal with this stuff? And some of you wondering, Lord, how long I got to deal with this? How long I got to go through this? How long will it be? And we are not to compare what we are going through with what the, the souls, the people of the souls have gone through. And they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord? This Lord is the sovereign one. This this Lord is the magistrate. This Lord is the master. Matter of fact, he is the absolute ruler. He is God. And he calls him holy. Holy means that he's blameless. Holy means that he is set apart. Holy means that that he is the only God as he is. He calls him holy and true. The word true means that he's reliable. You can count on God. You may not be able to count on other people, but you can count on God. You may not be able to depend on anybody else, but the God we serve is a reliable God. And because he's reliable, you can count on him. So they know he's reliable. They know he's holy. They know he's true. They know he will deliver as he said he would. And therefore, they're crying out to you. It says to us this morning that we need to cry out to the right person. It says to us this morning, stop crying out to her. Stop crying out to him. Stop crying out to them and cry out to God. When you're in a fix, when you're about to run off a cliff, you, you need to cry out to God. You don't call your mechanic. Does you no good to call mama. Does you no good to call daddy. You need to cry out to God. There's somebody that's listening to me this morning that you need to cry out to God. Matter of fact, all of us need to cry out to him. We need to cry out to God simply because if things are going right, we ought to cry out to him. If things are going wrong, we need to cry out to him. We need to make sure we cry out to the one who is holy and the one who is true. They ask the question, Lord, how long? How long? These folk going to get away with what they're doing. I know you're going to get revenge, but Lord, we want to know how long. I'm saying to you this morning, they can kill the body, but the soul will live on. Man can kill the body, but the soul can live on. That's that's why we have to trust in the God who can bless us. The God who can not only allow our bodies to be killed, but the God who has control of our souls. You see, many people depend more on people and are afraid of people more than they're afraid of God. But they have not a heaven or hell to put you in. They cannot take away. They cannot take away your soul. That's why it's important to be born again. It's important to have your soul anchored in the Lord. It's important to make sure that you're in the hand of God. Make sure that your soul is anchored in him. Make sure you're born again because man can only hurt the body. 
God keeps the soul. Look at the souls are crying out from out under the altar. The soul, the, they kill the body, but the soul lives on. Not, not, they're not, they're not under, their souls are not under the altar because of what they've done. Their souls are not under the altar because of what they care, how they carry themselves. Their souls are under the altar, not because of their death, not because of their sacrifice, but it's because of the sacrifice that Jesus already made on Calvary. It's because God has given his son and his son has given his blood. And because his son has given his blood, he washes us whiter than snow. We qualify for heaven simply because of Jesus and how we trust what he did on the cross. So they're not they're not under the altar. They don't have that position because of just their sacrifice. They don't have that position just because they went about doing the word of God. They don't have that position just because they had a testimony of who God is. But they have that position because of Jesus, the Christ, the one who died for us over 2000 years ago. Therefore, they're on the altar. The church wraps it up. The great tribulation begins to take place. These people are convicted of the word of God. And as they are convicted of the word of God, then they are crying out, Lord, how long? Lord, how long we got to put up with this? Lord, how long we got to? And let me just tell you the cause of death. The cause of death is because they stood on the word. The cause of death, because they continually stood on the word of God. The cause of death is because they testified of who God is and they begin to reach out to others and tell others what God is, who God is and what God can do. Their testimony is their cause of death. Their study of the word and their speaking of the word is the cause of death. If you're going to die for anything. You need to die for the Lord, for he's the one who not only keeps your body, he can also keep your soul. In verse number 11, verse 11, 11 says it. Then a white robe was given to each of them. Then a white robe was given to each of them. This white robe was a robe of robe of encouragement. This white robe was a robe to let them know that, that Jesus has paid it all. This white robe was to let them know that their death was not in vain. This white robe was a robe where each of them, they didn't share robes. The Bible says they cried out with one voice. They were on one accord. Oh, Lord, I wish the church would get on one accord. The Bible says they cried out with a great voice. They were on one accord. They wanted to know the same thing. They had the same desire and they cried out with a great voice. And when they cried out with a great voice, they were only crying out with one voice. They were in unison. So they were given a robe. Even though they had one voice, each one of them were given a separate robe. Each one of them was given a robe. They were given a robe and, and this robe was to remind them of the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus. And it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer. It was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the, the number of those who were fellow servants and the number of those who were brothering would be killed also. He says, and then when that is fulfilled, then it will be fulfilled. Then they will have vengeance taken upon them. Let me just say to you today in this little lesson, I want to say to you today that there will be a cause of death. The cause of death will be the fact that they stood on the word of God. The cause of death will be the fact that they testified of God and who God is. The cause of death will be the fact that, that they stood on the promises of God and they realized and they promoted who God is. And they were killed for it. And here they are in this heavenly scene, crying out before the Lord. 
They crying out before the Lord. This cry was much like a croak. So in other words, they were croaking like a raven would croak. They were screaming and the Bible says they were streaming, screaming out loudly. And even though they were screaming out loud, they were praying humbly. They were praying humbly because the fact of the matter is they were approaching the holy God. Now, when you approach him and you remind him of what you're asking him to do, what you need to understand is that as God is approached, he must be approached humbly simply because he is God. They were crying out. They approached God in prayer. They were crying out, approaching God humbly. It was a cry for justice. It was a cry for a time limit in a time frame. It was a cry for a timeline. It was a cry for judgment and a cry for vengeance. When, God, are you going to vindicate us? It was a cry unto the Lord, the absolute master, the absolute ruler. It was a cry unto the Lord himself, the one who is blameless, the, the one who is reliable, the one who is true. If you're going to cry out to anybody, take a minute today to cry out to the Lord. <laughs> Take a minute today to cry out to the one who is the absolute ruler. Take a minute today to cry out to the one who will judge and who will bring vengeance back to the earth. These souls under the altars crying out to God, much like we see men, women, boys and girls protesting and crying out unto the, the system every day. We live in a messed up system. We live in a system that is based on race, that is based on problems, that is based on economics. And we are crying out, even in the streets today, we are crying out unto the Lord. And as we cry out to the Lord, we are asking the Lord, Lord, how long? We're asking the Lord, how long will these children, these adults, these people who died at the hands of police officers, how long will you allow it to go, Lord? How long will you allow us to tear up our own neighborhoods? How long will you allow black on black crime, white on black crime, black on white crime, yellow on yellow crime? Lord, how long will you bring this? How long will you allow this to come into existence before you bring judgment, before you bring vengeance, before we can be vindicated? They're crying out in the streets every day, every single day of our lives. We're watching somebody protest. Somebody's crying out. Somebody's wondering, Lord, how long will this continue to go on? How long will this continue to, to manifest itself? We're even marching in the streets saying no justice, no peace. The, the souls under the altar is saying, Lord, how long will you allow them to walk the earth and not punish them? Our final point is found in verse number 11. We must honor the process. Regardless of what we're going through today, we must honor the process. The process is already laid out. We must honor the process. The problem today, we don't want to walk in faith because we don't want to honor the process. We say we walk in faith, but don't you know that there must be some rain that will fall on the just as well as the unjust? Let me just share with you today. We need to understand God has a process in place. We must honor the process. Verse number 11 says it to us today that we must honor the process as they are having to honor the process. The souls under the altar are having to honor the process. Verse number 11, then they were given white robes. These white robes are encouragement to them to hang on in there a little, little while longer. God is encouraging us every day to hang on in there just a little while longer. Then a white robe was given to each of them and it was said to them that they should rest a while. They should rest a while longer. In other words, there was no work going on. They, they, was not, they were not in the midst of things that, 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 that caused them pain. They just was curious enough. They just wanted to know how long. It says you're going to wait a little while longer. Just wait a little, a little while longer. I want to say to you today what you're going through. Just wait just a little while longer. God is still in control. 
Just wait just a little while longer because God is coming and, and, and God is going to set the record straight. Just wait a little while longer. He says to them, I know you're looking for a timeline. Let me give you some words of encouragement right now and let you know I'm going to give you a white robe. He gives them a white robe and it is the robe that was washed with the blood of Jesus. According to Revelation chapter 7 and 14, the question is asked, who are they? It says that these are the ones, these in these white robes, these are the ones who have successfully come out of the great tribulation. You're given a white robe. They wanted a timeline. They wanted a time limit. They, they wanted to know when God was going to come and, and be a blessing by avenging, by serving justice, by vindicating them. He says, wait just a little while longer. There are some folk that still got to be killed. <laughs> There are some brothers and sisters that, that haven't made it under the altar yet. There are some brothers and sisters that's going to stand on the word of God during these times after the church is gone. There are going to be some brothers and sisters that's going to stand on the word of God. There are going to be some brothers and sisters that's going to testify of God's goodness. They got to come. They got to be slain. They're going to have to be killed. Trust the process. And many times when we trust the process, and we honor the process, it's not good news for us. The process doesn't always give us good news. It's a, it's a sad thing when every time the preacher preach, you can shout on it. It's a sad thing when every time the preacher stand, he gives you good news. Because when I look at the prophets of old, the prophets of old did not always give good news. First of all, they gave bad news and then they will close out with the good news. And that's what we ought to do today. We ought to close out with the good news. I'm telling you, honor the process. Whatever God is taking you through, allow God to take you through. I said whatever God is taking you through, not what you're putting yourself through. Because some people are their own worst enemies. Don't put yourself through a process that you don't have to go through. Allow God to take you through the process. And when God is taking you through the process, Honor the process, trust the process, endure the process because Jesus did it. There's a process you got to go through. You can't short circuit the process. You can't go around the process. You can't impede the process. You can't usurp the authority of the process. God has a process that you just going to have to go through. What is the process? What is the process? It has been said that we are twice children. And once adults, we can see it every day. We're twice children and once adults. That's a process you can't get past. The only way you're going to get past that process is that you get out of here. The only way to get past this process is that you die. I want to tell you today, trust the process, honor the process, endure the process, and God has a great victory on the other side. The text declares to us, this is the fifth seal. And in this fifth seal, we need to understand that we have an opportunity to observe those who are not saved, that get saved in the midst of the great tribulation. Then they're on the altar crying out aloud, croaking out aloud like a raven would croak. They are crying out aloud for justice. And we are still on planet Earth crying for justice today. But one of these days. We're going to get out of here before this process even takes place. One of these days, if you're saved, if you're born again, this process is not a process that you have to go through. You can be saved today. You can be born again today. You don't have to go through this crying process. You don't have to be under the altar. You don't have to cry out for justice. You can have peace with God. You can have the peace of God even while you're walking around here on planet Earth. I tell you, trust the process because Jesus had to trust the process over 2000 years ago. He trust the process over 2000 years ago. He gave his life as a ransom, a voluntary gift. He gave his life as a payment. He gave his life to buy us back, to redeem us. He gave his life. Jesus trust the process. Peter tried to get Jesus killed. In a midnight brawl, he tried to cut, he cut Malchus's ear off. Jesus reaches down, picks Malchus's ear up, puts it back on the side of his head and said, put up your sword, Peter. There's a process. 
Peter is trying to get Jesus killed in a brawl when God already has the process laid out. What's the process, preacher? I'm so glad you asked. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on Calvary. He gave his life on Calvary. He died on Calvary between two thieves. They killed him on Calvary. They murdered him on Calvary. He voluntarily gave up his life on Calvary's hill. He died for you and he died for me. He was trusting the process. He was honoring the process. He was in doing the process. He died on Calvary. They took him off the cross, laid him in a barber tomb. It was a barber tomb because he didn't need it too long. It was a barber tomb because every morning the process showed up and the process paid off. Early that third day morning, he got up with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. You can go to heaven. You can be born again if you trust the process. The process is to trust Jesus as your personal Lord and your personal Savior. He died for you over 2,000 years ago. He gave his life for you over 2,000 years ago. He laid at a borrowed tomb for you over 2,000 years ago. Early that third day morning, over 2,000 years ago, while you were yet in your sin, he got up with all power from the grave. You can be saved. Right here, right now, the door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. Will you trust Jesus? Will you trust what he did on Calvary? Will you come now and get to know him? The door is open. There may be somebody present with us today who never received Jesus Christ as your personal savior. This is your moment. This is your opportunity. You don't have to go through the four horsemen, period. You don't have to go through the famine that the book of Revelation talk about. You can be born again. You can be saved right here today. Just believe the story that Jesus died for you. He was buried for you. And he rose from the dead just for you. The door is open. This is your invitation. If you never trusted him, trust him today. If you want to be saved right here, right now, just bow your head today and get to know Jesus. Just repeat these simple words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Jesus, I believe that you gave your life for me. I believe that you voluntarily died for me. I believe that you rose from the dead. I'm asking you to save my soul. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. We believe if you pray this prayer honestly believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We believe that you're born again. You are saved. You're on your way to heaven when you die. You don't have to go through this revelation process where you will be crying on an altar. You don't have to go through this process of, of going through the great tribulation. You can be saved right here today. And if you bow your head and honestly believe that Jesus is the son of God and that he died for you and rose for you, you are now born again. You're on your way to heaven. And while you're still here, you need to be working in God's vineyard. You need to be working and being a part of God's vineyard. You need to get in a good Bible teaching church where the word of God is taught, where the word of God is obeyed. I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the one who leads, where Jesus is the master, where Jesus is the captain. I recommend the New Beginning Church. If you reached out today, if we've reached you and you're willing to reach out today, let us know that you received Jesus Christ during this broadcast. Let us know that you need a church home. Inbox us and let us know. And we'll be glad to welcome you to the New Beginning Church. We're located here at 4251 Shurmai Road, Houston, Texas. That's Shurmai Road, S-C-H-U-R-M-I-E-R, S-C-H-U-R-M-I-E-R. -E We're here at the New Beginning Church, 4251 Shurmai Road, Houston, Texas, 77048. Please come by and visit with us. Please come and let us know. Please come and, 
and re rejoice with us. And if you if you receive Christ today, we really want to rejoice with you. If you want a new church home, we welcome you to this church. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. Thank you for attending. We say God bless you. It is now offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. You can give by two means. First of all, you can give by Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Or you can mail in your gifts, your offerings, to New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Thank you so much for your gifts. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for these gifts. We thank you for blessing us. We thank you for income. We thank you for increase. We thank you for who you are, Father God. And we thank you for every person who is given. We ask you to bless them even 100 fold. Bless them to walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen and thank God. We have many on our prayer list today. Let us pray for one another. And pray for the New Beginning Church. Pray for, for a New Beginning Church. Pray for health. Pray for strength. Pray for empowerment. Pray that we reach souls for Jesus Christ. Lift up and call out the name New Beginning Church, 4251. Sure, my road, Houston, Texas, 77048. Call our name out. Call the name of the New Beginning Church out. Pray with us and, and pray for us. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your gifts. Thanks for being a part of our service. Here at the New Beginning Church, we are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we're reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, in I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. God bless you and God keep you. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Father God, for this word. We ask you to bless this word, that this word will fall on good soil. We ask you to convict. We ask you to save. We ask you to convert. We ask you, Father God, to approve those who have listened and those who will listen. We pray, Father God, that you continue to bless our church. Bless our church to grow in, in numbers. Bless our church to grow financially. And most of all, Lord, bless our church to grow spiritually. That we will give you the glory, all the honor and all the praise. We praise you, we honor you, we glorify you. We thank you, Lord, and we say hallelujah to your name. For we know you are the only true God. We know you're the holy God. And we know that we can follow the process. Bless us to follow the process. Bless us to see these seals being opened and glorify your name and honor you. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise, the only great God, unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us say together, amen, amen. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Be blessed.